much a long time. We're coming to this week to the uh, third book of the Torah, Vayikra, and he called. You know, uh, this third book is a very special book because it's written in a period according to the Torah in one month, at the beginning of the second year after the Yexia or the Epsit from Mizraim, from Egypt. And um, here is when basically the people of Israel are coming together, organizing themselves, and they are just finishing the Ohel Moel or the Mishkan or the Mikdash, the sanctuary, the place in which they are going to meet. I, I would like for you to make a little bit of understanding from the beginning to what we have arrived here. We start with Bereshit that is a very general and about creation and including all uh, humanity and, um, uh, and the beginning of the people of Israel We our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then after that, we are going to go in the entrance of uh, Egypt and the time and period in which from being a guest, we became a slaves. And after that, we, this is what a, a, the book of Shemot or Exodus is going to talk about these moments as they coming out of Egypt. And in the process, the creator is going to do uh, something special for Israel. Israel needs to have a change of mentality, a change of mind. Uh, Israel was totally, let me put it in this way, polluted. You know, some people say corrupted, but I would like to use the word polluted. And, and polluted means that they had assimilated, they had accepted ideas, uh, foreigns, to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This teaching from Abraham Abinu, about there is only one creator, there is no other besides him, and that there is no other gods, you know? That was a very, uh, a, a very uh, I would say, uh, revolutionary for all those civilizations of the time. And especially to talk about a creator or a God invisible that nobody can see. You know, for them, for that culture, for those civilizations, they needed to see their gods. And most of their gods became the makers, were made by themselves. You know, in Bereshit, they say, God created, you know, men. God made, uh, God created men. How? He made it to his likeness and image. It's God who creates men. But what does humanity? Humanity does just the, just the opposite. If we say that the... Uh, Men create their own gods, not to the lightness and image. And how this this men create their own gods? We need to understand that. You know, if I make a god, I, I make my, my own god, you know, my own god is going to be there to serve me. You know? And then God is going to be under my disposition. Uh, I will tell him what to do, and he will do it for me. No, in order to obtain that, I will need to, from time to time, pass my hand over him uh, uh, or over them and try to gain their goodwill. And, you know, or, or we play that game. I give you, you give me, I, I'm nice, you are nice, you know, all, all this process. Then comes Abraham Abinu and revolutionized the world. There is only one God, an invisible God. And this is the idea that Israel is going to be the messenger for the whole universe. We receive the tablets, the Ten Commandments, and from there it is Israel is going to go forward. But it happened something very bad. The Egel Sahab, the Egel Sahab, the golden calf. And this golden calf literally brought back Israel to zero. And then the creator is going to work up again with Israel. And in order to do that, he is going to fashion something for the people of Israel. The Ohel Moed, the Mishkan, 
the Midrash, the place in which Israel is going to focus their sight and they are going to look at him alone. You know, at the time, just before the creation of the of El Moed, you know, even at the time of our, our forefathers, they would build a misbeach, altars, everywhere that they could. This time, from this moment on, there's going to be only one place, and it's going to be where the tent of meeting was located. But now, they're finishing the, the uh, finally, the Creator has forgiven uh, the people of Israel for this ugly uh, sin, and we are now in the moment of the inauguration of this place, this special place. This special place is going to bring to them a lot of things. But uh, it's a process. Remember, this is a process. Do you remember when I gave you this mashal about uh, Mizraim, Egypt, as uh, the surrogate mother, and uh, she uh, in, uh, takes in her wounds Israel? But uh, is, uh, the, the idea was that the mother was a drug addict. You know, as a drug addict, she passed the drug addiction to the baby that she has, the, the baby girl that she has inside the belly. And I say baby girl because then later on there is the picture that, that is the creator who marries this girl. You know, there is a, it's a wedding. But this, this baby girl is born with all the addictions of is, uh, Egypt. And then what the creator is going to do, you know? He can say hocus pocus in one second to take everything away and deliver uh, Israel from any problem. But from the beginning, we need to understand our creator. He gave us what we call it, the hirah of she, free will. And this is very important because that differentiates us from the rest of the creation. The animals who are closer to us in the sense of uh, creativity or the uh, living beings, you know, they do not have what we have. We have free will. We have the capability to act, to think, and to do. Then in this process, the creator is going to use a method. You know, uh, is, uh, today, uh, I mentioned to you before, is that when somebody is, for example, ad addict to heroin, this is a very bad drug, and they are treated with a, a, a lesser drug that's called methadone, you know? And then why they use methadone? Because in that way, this drug is going to take the desire and the, the um, addiction, little by little, from the, um, from, from the, the, the real drug, what is heroin. The real drug that, that came with Israel was idolatry. And then the creator is going to use a different drug that is a little lesser and less, is going to be less addictive than the idolatry of Egypt. And you're going to see all this process in a, in a picture about the, how the, the the creator is going down and down and down and down, eliminating a lot of things and focusing Israel on him. It's very important. Now, also, I would like to, to ask you this thing when you study the scriptures. You need to uh, ask you this question when you read whatever you read. Ask the first question is, to whom is being written? This is very important, okay? The second one is, when? Uh, 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 to whom is written, at what time historically, when that happens. And third, you know, you need to say, you know, uh, 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 to whom is written, when is written, and why is written in this way. All these three questions, we need to answer ourselves to be clear what the Creator is trying to communicate to the people of Israel. We are going to start here with, in this short first aliyah. You know, the, the, the root of the, the, 
the Sharosh, the, 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 the roots of the word uh, Kereb, Korba, uh, uh, use Korban, Korbanot, all, all those words are 12 words here that are all related to the same idea, to, cl to come closer or to be near to. That this is the idea. Korbanot that is used in the in the in here in Baikra at the beginning of this book, uh, and we are going to see it during this book. What is really the meaning? One of the greatest problems that we have is about understanding and translation. You know, because even our our sages arguing about what will be the best word to tra to translate. Korban, korbanot. And one of the, the greatest problems is that there is no an English word for us to really to have a good acception of the word. But there are two words that are being used in most of our uh, Bibles in our translation. One is uh, offering, and the other is sacrifice. Neither of the two are close to this uh, to this meaning, but uh, at least offering is the closer to it uh, instead of the uh, sacrifice. Sacrifice brings a different idea. Secondly, I want to give you a picture. Uh, 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 when we, uh, when we, we are invited, for example, for a Shabbat dinner to any home, you know, we, what are we usually we do? You know, we bring something, no, to to the to to to, to the people who has invited you, and, and when you bring something, is 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 a, a, a you are showing your, not only you respect your reverend, but you are you are being grateful, no, or the invitation, or you are being you, you or you are a consider that. Is 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 an action of reverence or or, or a special a, a, a condition that you're saying? I am glad that you invite me. I bring you something. Okay. If you read carefully in uh, the first, the second verse of the Parashava Yikra, or the first chapter. Here say, "Daver el bene Israel be a Marta alehem." Adam. Kiji kri, mi ken korban la donai. And and the Lord spoke, no, and said to the people of Israel, the men. And it's interesting here; it doesn't use the word ish, doesn't use the benayra, use the word Adam. To me, it's a very important already message, because the word Adam is a really defined humanity. And to me, that is a universality. The message, the message always is the Torah, is, is a universal message. We, the Jewish people, sometimes, we have taken only for us. But uh, this message is for all humanity. You know why? Because our God, blessed be his name, the creator of the universe, the Boreolam, he created humanity. You know? And only that we need to understand is that he made roles for different groups. And Israel had a, a role, a, a purpose, a plan to do, and that was to be all Legoim, be light to the rest of the world. But nothing that because they were better than anybody else, not because they were outstanding, nothing like that. Was because the, the Lord wanted to do. And here is the secret. At the beginning of this book, the word va yikra. The conjunction of the verb va is not an, and yikra, call. You know, we need to be called. If we are called, we can respond to his calling. You know, the Shemoah, we listen this, you know, Shema. You know, people translate it to listen. 
But really, you know what, it, what it, in, the, in, in, in the scripture, what it really means? We obey. It's obedience. Now, they have been created this idea that uh, the creator is, is a God that uh, a very, very, what I would call it, very barbaric and very, uh, a, a, a God that loves to have blood. And, and, and enjoy in, in, in the uh, in something like uh, the the pain of others, you know? especially uh, the animals today and this time that I'm talking to you. There are so many groups that are uh, animals defenders and all those things that they come in in this world today. That they look at the scripture and they say this God was a, a blood thirsty God. He was a vindictive God, and that is the idea that came in the first century by a man called Marcion, you know, who, who, who talked to us about that the God of the Old Testament uh, is, is a different God from the God of the New Testament because the God of the New Testament is a God of love and the God of the Old Testament is a God of blood and vengeance. This is the problem what we don't understand. I say to you, when you read the scriptures, First of all, read it to whom he's writing, when he's writing, and why. No? And here is the, the answer. Israel was totally polluted with idolatry. And they needed to come little by little out of idolatry. And the Creator is going to show them about something that is very important. And he's saying, now that we have the, the tent, we are organized because you are accustomed, listen, huh? you are accustomed to sacrifice things to your gods, to the other gods. That was normal. You know, the, we needed to appease their gods. Our creator doesn't need to be appeased. And our creator cannot be bought. Our creator cannot be uh, deceived. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He is the one that created us. Then we cannot play the game with him. Then he's going to prepare us in a little by little process about that we need to focus, that is the reason of the Mishkan, to focus on him, to have these, these uh, different types of korbanot or offerings, and each one was going to have a meaning, and it's going to bring the people of Israel at that time. This is very important. Little by little, getting away from idolatry. Who explained that's a wonderful explanation is in Morene Bukhin by our dear Rabbi uh, Moshe Maimonides, you know, in, in his book, that, and he talks about these things. But instead to, to trying to convince you about something in one way or the other, this also has a practical things to do at that time. What, one, to serve the God, and secondly, the, the sacrifices that were done at that time basically were to feed the people too. You know, was a, had a double side. The, you know, uh, have you seen, uh, 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 one time I saw a movie uh, in which a, a, a primitive tribe uh, in Africa, uh, uh, they, they were hunters, and they would kill an animal. After they killed an animal, they put their hands and they gave thanks for the life of the animal that gave life to them. The, the idea is, is, is a beautiful idea because that idea is we give thanks to the Creator for giving us food, you know? And, and that was a, a, a way to change our, our, our idol, idolatrous in, uh, uh, insight to focus on the Creator. That was, it's a process. And the Creator is winning us out of idolatry. That is a principle, why he did it, you know? When, at the time that they left Egypt, that is the period of the time that was given. Uh, uh, they were getting out, and why? Because the Creator 
needed to take Israel out of idolatry. But in here, there are many, many very practical teachings. First of all is, uh, uh, and this, uh, what I just read, is say, whoever brings himself something from himself, Miken, okay, from himself, a man who brings something to the creator, from himself. You know, everybody immediately thinks about bring an animal. But uh, what, is, what is the most important thing to approach God Korban, to approach God, to be close to God. What is the most important thing? The animal or you? You see, here is when we need to start understanding a little bit uh, about the meanings of the Korbanot, about approaching, being closer to the Creator. The Creator is there with open arms, but uh, we need to accept the invitation as Dennis just mentioned to us. And, and to accept the invitation, we need to be totally, and this is very important, clean. And what I mean to be totally clean? It does not mean that you have forgiven yourself or anything like that. No. Totally clean is, it means to us to be totally honest with ourselves and with the Creator. You know, one of the portions of this book of Vayikra that is going to make emphasis is about Tahorot, cleaning. And it's going to make an emphasis about approaching the Creator clean, you know, not polluted. And what is the only way that you can be clean? And this is a beautiful word that we sometimes we don't use it and we use it in the wrong way. Teshuvah, you know? Teshuvah is not about being repented as many people think about, but it's about acknowledging about our actions and trying to make it right when we approach the Creator, because the Creator already knows what we have done. We cannot deceive Him. The animal is only the introduction. But in order that we can introduce ourselves, it's a moment of the Samach, where we put our hands, that we are confessing ourselves. We are saying we have done something wrong. There's another beautiful teaching about this in this first chapter. It's about who are the ones that they need this process. I call it process. In chapter four of the Esbaikra, start uh, and for the first time you're going to read in chapter four, uh, of, uh, for the first time there is a term that many of us will like it, you know. Uh, verse three, what does it say? In Hakohen Hamashiach. What it means is, uh, is a priest that has been anointed. For the first time, the word Mashiach appears. No? But what I'm going to tell you here, in this verse, that the priest is a human being like anybody else and has sins like anybody else. There is no a perfect man doesn't exist. That, that is a creation of theology. The perfection of man doesn't exist. The Creator made us humans. And when we became humans, we had our imperfection. That everybody, without exception, needs this approaching the Creator and to do the right things. You go uh, in, in chapter three. Uh, uh, also, it's, it's very uh, chapter, uh, chapter four. I'm sorry. The first of all, they say in chapter in verse thirteen talks about uh, in this. Uh, I just mentioned that pre the priest the, and their children they need to have a, cor a korban 
for forgiving his other sins. No? Before uh, 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 approaching God and saying, I'm sorry, I have done wrong. In verse 13, the whole community, the whole community needs to do it. But I also, in and call my attention in verse 22. I shall not see the president of the, of the community needs to make also a, a request for forgiveness of their sins. In this brief uh, verse 4 is the Hata, the chapter 4 is about the uh, Korban Hata. No? It, it's about that all of us, we are being polluted. And all of us, we need to approach God and we need to ask for His cleanliness. There is nobody here better than anybody else. No, the high priest not the community, not the president of the congregation. All of us, we are equal before the Creator. The animals and the sacrifices, this is the wrong idea. And this idea is that there is the blood who forgives our sins, is the blood who uh, who, uh, who covers everything, and we don't need to worry about that. From the beginning, that's not true here in the Torah. If you go to chapter 5, verse, uh, from verse 11, they say, if you can no afford two turtle doves or two young pigeons, then that person will bring a tenth of an ephah of wheat, flour, and an offering for the sin committed. And he must not mix oil with it or put incense on it, since this is a sacrifice for sin. He will bring it to, to the priest, and who will take a handful in his memorial and burn this on the altar, addition to the offerings of food burned for the Lord. This Sacrifice, this offering, is for sin. I don't know if you know that the wheat has blood, because maybe it can have blood, but what are you telling here? All those people who teach you the opposite, they are inventing, because they misread certain passages, like a, and by Ikra, we are going to see it later on, Leviticus 17, 11, the, and take it out of context of what it is. But uh, even more deeply than that, let me read to you now, in the time of Jeremiah, this is after the temple, okay? If we go to Jeremiah, chapter 7. Jeremiah Juhanabi, the prophet Jeremiah. I'm going to start with verse 21 only for the context. Chapter 7, verse 21. The Lord of the armies, the God of Israel, say this, Adonai Sebaot, add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat all the meat. For when I brought your, and I brought your ancestors, this is very important, out of Egypt, I, had, I say nothing to them, gave them no orders about burnt offerings or sacrifices. M my one command to them was this, listen to my voice, then I will be your God, and you shall be my people. In everything, follow my way, and I mark out for you, and you shall prosper. But then they did not listen, they did not pay attention, and they did not follow their own device. And here, the word listening, you, you 
need to change it for the word obey. They didn't obey, didn't do it, no. But what is important? Look like that here there is a contradiction. The contradiction, how he say that I didn't say anything? Do you remember when I asked you when, uh, to whom, and when, and why? This is why we need to understand. When the Creator gave this about the offerings and the things of the animals, was a process for Israel to get out of idolatry. During that process, Israel committed mistakes sometimes. They gave more emphasis to the rituals than to the reality of themselves. And it's then later on that the, the prophets are going to bring Israel back to the real idea. There are many, many verses in the scripture, you know, about no sacrifices. But I want to give you a short list in order that you can look for yourself about the, the creator who said, I do not want sacrifices. What I want is a contrite heart. You, you can see in Psalm 51, 16, and Psalm 46, and in the prophets, Hosea 6, 6, and Hosea 8, 11, and following. Or also, in, among, in the, the prophet, 1 Samuel, chapter 15, verse 22, about Shaul. And here's a very interesting, and let me give you this picture for you to understand. Do you remember that Shaul said to the, uh, he was asked to kill all the Amalekites, and to kill everything. But uh, instead to do that, he kept everything, the best, the people and the animals, you know? And then comes Samuel, the prophet, and tell him you have lost your kinship. And he was the first Mashiach. He was anointed as a king. I tell you also that the Mashiach, they can be taken or given, no? And then, what did he say? What his excuse was? I did it for the creator, this event. And then finally he said, I did it because the people pushed me to do it. Compared to King David, with this sin that he did, terrible sin, no? Taking the, the woman of one of his generals, having an affair with her, and then the prophet, Nathan, went to see him and tell his story, and he realized that he was the one that did it after that. And what was his reaction? He confessed it and said, it's my fault. What is the difference between Shaul and King David? Even if we compare maybe what uh, King David was worse than Shaul. What is the difference? The confession. He acknowledged and accepted what he did wrong. Before God, he didn't cleanse himself or blame others. We are going to start a journey in this book. This book, the book of Ayikra, the third book, that I told you this only one month of the, of the life of Israel, but it's, it's, it's the most misunderstood book that I have ever uh, read. It's misunderstood because there is more theology than understanding God's me message. 
we are more inclined to believe in theologizing than to understand what the Creator is doing with His people. And I would like to challenge all of you to get out of the mysticism and to try to understand what the Creator was doing with the people of Israel at that time. Because we are evolving and we are changing. You know, there are many people who would love to have again to come back to the system of sacrifices and things like that. Do you think at this time do we need this type of sacrifices? But we need sacrifices. And what does it mean sacrifice in you and me? To abstain from something that we wanted, to stop doing something that we would like to do, or sometimes to give up certain things that are not convenient to us. Or we will take a relationship with the Creator. Sometimes, believe me or not, we are so selfish that we are the center of the universe. And we are so self-centered that we forget about other people. We are forget about our neighbors. If you take sacrifice not in the negative way, but in the positive way, because that word is terrible sometimes when you, you hear the word sacrifice. But if you understand a true giving, for example, you know, let's, let's, let's give you a very, uh, a, a very simple example. You know, let's suppose that you have an amount of money and you wanted to buy yourself a new car and you have been saving. And suddenly comes a, a, a family, a person that has a very, very strong need and that, and, and you can help them. And you say, you know, my car can wait. I need to give it to this person. How many of you that has relatives in other countries that are going through difficult times? And you live here and you have many wonderful things. But I, to live here is also expensive. You know, cheap. And then, you are already making plans to buy this and to buy that, and then you receive a call from your country and they say, we are starving to death, we don't have anything. And you make a conscious decision. You know what? This thing can wait for us. Even that we, we have been planning to have it, we are going to wait, but I want to now give it to them what they need. That is what the Creator is talking about, Korbanot. That we are giving ourselves. Not somebody else, we are giving ourselves. We need to start changing our mentality. The Torah helps us to see things. But please don't be literalist trying to go beyond and trying to see the purpose of our Creator. And today, let me ask you this thing. I mentioned to you at the beginning that Israel left Egypt polluted. <coughs> let me ask you this question to you today. Are we polluted? You say, I didn't say, are you? <laughs> because I included myself. Are we polluted? What do you mean polluted? How many things we have over us that cannot allow us to see clear? How many of us have with lenses so fog that we don't see reality? 
and we need to clean our glasses. We need to clean inside. What are your idols? What are your substitute for the creator? Your well-being, your welfare, your modus vivendus, the way that you are, your personality, your, your job. What, what is your God now? Money, prestige, popularity? Think about that. Are we polluted? Because the korban is to help us to approach God, to get close, kereb, korban, to get closer to the Creator and to have a relationship with Him. Shabbat shalom. <laughs>